Welcome to Remix EQ Live, where we are amplifying equity with a mix of information, interviews, and inspiration. I'm your host, Dr. Erica Tate, and today I am streaming live from Savannah, Georgia, where I live. <laughs> and so for <laughs> those who are joining us today, please drop a greeting of choice in the comments. Let us know where you are joining from and the equity work that you do or aspire to do. And remember, Remix EQ Live is an experience that's meant to be shared. So I encourage you to hit the share button and invite your people, your network, your family, your friends to join us. And while those comments are flowing in and those invitations are flowing out, I want to remind you that Remix EQ Live offers us the opportunity to connect and build mm -hmm. community with each other around the equity work being performed throughout the world. And we do this by centering the work. That is our guests and our viewers share examples of what they do in their role or position as a way to illustrate the innovative and effective ways that they advance equity in the spaces in which they live, work, or play. So throughout the show and in the comments, I invite you to share what you do to make the world a more just place. And on today's show, I'm remixing Dr. Nicole Pinkard, who is the Alice Hamilton Professor of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University, and Jean-Claude Brizard, the President and CEO of Digital Promise Global. Our conversation today will center on equity-driven approaches to increasing access to innovative digital and STEM learning experiences among those who've been historically and systematically underserved. So let's rally and kick off this remix. And we'll start with you, Nicole. I invite you to introduce yourself. And as you do, please share any career twists and turns that have led you to your current role. I am um, excited to be here. This is actually my first podcast I've, I've done. and do So I'm like, you know, I'm excited to uh, do this. So uh, my name is Nicole Pinker, that she said. I am, it's, I'm so happy to say it's the first time I said it, the Alice Hamilton professor. Um, uh, in learning sciences in Northwestern. Um, and that means a lot for me because in my twist and turns, I never set out to be a professor. That just was not the goal. Um, I didn't have any images, uh, you know, even through college of, of um, a black woman uh, as a professor in the STEM spaces. So my goal was to get my computer science degree from uh, Stanford and figure out how to make money. I'm old enough, I'm 52, that Silicon Valley didn't exist. So when I came out of <laughs> undergrad, Literally, I came out um, when in 92 when the economy crashed. And so instead of going to work for IBM, where I thought I was going to be a management consultant, I ended up in graduate school because IBM said, hey, there's this thing called the GEMS Fellowship and go get your master's for two years. And uh, if the economy gets better, we'll come back and hire you. So um, that began my journey uh, to say, OK, let's get a master's degree. And for me, I ended up at Northwestern that didn't have a master's program, only had a PhD program. And so the agreement was, well, hey, you know, there's this thing. If you go into a PhD program and leave after two years, you get a master's. So the agreement was I was the first master's student in the first PhD program in learning sciences at Northwestern. But um, fortunate, I had some phenomenal um, uh, mentors, Louis Gomez, Carol Lee, who had other plans for me. And their plans was that I was going to get a PhD. Um, and so I stayed and um, ended up at Michigan as a professor, um, but then also followed my own passion to say, well, I in the space of technology, if you go back to the 2000s, to understand what it meant to do educational technology really required you getting your hands dirty. So I came back to Chicago, worked at the University of Chicago at the intersection of being the lead of uh, technology innovation for the charter schools why I still was really hyper-focused on my research. Gonna sort of end with there, but my twists and turns really are that um, I've always just followed the journey uh, and the path to, to get better access to the spaces and places to try to understand how do we create equity. And that by doing that work, you end up with a portfolio that allows you to you know, be a, a professor in a, in, a, in a research institution. So looking forward to uh, this conversation to talk about how do we create more equitable opportunities. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your journey. I'm looking forward to it, too. Um, Jean-Claude, please introduce yourself and your career twist and turn. Sure. Nicole, it's good to see you again. Um, let me just say, uh, my life, I wanted to be Nicole. Uh, I wanted to be a college professor somewhere. Um, so my life has been about twists and turns. What I'm doing now and perhaps what I've done 
in the last maybe decade or so were never on any radar. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very type A. I, I like to understand the road I'm taking in my life, except that it never is as linear <laughs> as any of us uh, ever wants to be. So I, I went to college, wanted to be a pre-med um, student, um, ended up getting a degree in chemistry instead, only because I did not like hospitals. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I volunteered at a hospital in, in New York City, realized I did not like the smell. <laughs> and I said, I can't do this. Um, so I majored in chemistry. I thought I was going to be in, go be getting my PhD and go be a university professor somewhere. Um, I ended up as, as a teacher uh, temporarily at Rikers Island in Queens, New York. Uh, and that in many ways changed my life, um, Erica. You know, I saw, I met a young man who looked just like me, uh, same physical stature, uh, et cetera, who could not do basic computation, dropped out fifth grade school. Um, within six months, he was near pre-algebra. So we yeah. lost, I think, a PhD mathematician. And I said, you know what, let me sp spend a few years and do something about this. So I went on the front end to a middle school in Bushwick, Brooklyn, taught for four years and fell in love um, uh, with a bunch of eighth graders. And, and that was the end of it. And I went to a high school. Uh, I kept getting offered jobs. I kept saying, like, two more years, one more year, two more years. Uh, and kept, I became an assistant principal, principal, uh, head of the high school division in New York, New York City, a regional superintendent. Uh, I was about to go to Harvard to get, uh, again, go back to the PhD. Uh, my then girlfriend, now my wife, uh, said, you know, this thing called the Broad Center, you ought to try it and go be a superintendent. I'm like, ah, that's not my job. That's not what I want to do. Uh, so make a long story short, I went to Broad. Um, before I finished the program, I was offered a job in Rochester, New York as a superintendent. I said, okay, five years here and I'm done. I'm going to go back to somewhere in New England and be a professor somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I got a call from, from Newark, New Jersey first with uh, Cory Booker. Um, to think about being the school soup in Newark. Um, there's a book uh, called The Prize. I think on page 100 talks about my interview, my engagement with that process. Before it finished, I got a call from Mom Emanuel and went to Chicago uh, as mm -hmm. the CEO of schools in Chicago. Never in my life I thought I would be leading the third largest system in the country. I learned a ton in the city, amazing educators in the city. Didn't like uh, dealing with city hall politics. I mean, just be blunt about that. Um, that, that makes the job that much more difficult, frankly. Um, but from there, you know, I just, just kept following the pathway. And to Nicole's point, you know, you build a portfolio, you get the mentorship, you, are, you, you get to know people, things come your way. So I spent four years at the Gates Foundation doing amazing work. And then this job opened at Digital Promise, and I got a call by a headhunter, and I knew the organization. Uh, mm -hmm. And to Nicole, we got about 40 learning scientists on staff who are doing really amazing, amazing work, especially mm -hmm. leading on this idea of serving mm -hmm. kids who are systematically excluded from, from participation. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Yes, we love to normalize the twists and turns. And it was really great to hear how you guys have moved in and out of different positions and especially um, always with this focus on improving this um, educational spaces. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, we have a few comments. We have um, someone who's like, hey, computer science, yay. Yes, you see that <laughs> STEM degree and how it moved everyone through <laughs> the spaces mm -hmm. in education. And Brianna says, hello. So welcome, welcome. And then we have Dr. Galindo from Stewart, Florida. Yes, I like that we're covering all the time zones today. <laughs> all right, mm -hmm. so for those who are just joining us, this is Remix Eat You Live, where we're amplifying equity through a mix of information, interviews, and inspiration. And now that you've learned a little bit more about Nicole and Jean-Claude, I know that you're inviting others. And of course, <laughs> I invite you to interact with us. So post comments, ask questions as we dive into this interview. You are part of the Remix EQ Live experience. Experience. So now we center to center the work. This is an mm -hmm. opportunity for us to learn from Nicole and Jean Claude about their approaches and strategies for creating more equitable learning experiences. So we'll start with you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. In your role as the Alice Hamilton Professor at Northwestern University, how do you work toward equitable access to STEM learning for youth? Mm -hmm. So I my approach goes back really to the foundational training in learning sciences. And for me, as a computer scientist, I think through systems. Like, so if we have a conversation, I am thinking about some type of process system that's gonna facilitate that. But the learning sciences really focus on the intersection of context, con cognition, and design. So all work for me has to first begin with a real context, a real environment, real world problems. 
and understanding those in partnerships with uh, community members to really get at how technology or systems can be an approach. And so for me, also it's connected with thinking about technology with my own journey. As a, as a Black woman in, um, in STEM, oftentimes we think about the teaching of the subject, but for me, it was actually through sports where I became comfortable being the only girl, being the only Black, I was only growing a basketball team, the only black person on a softball team. So I got comfortable being the only. So when I would go into a STEM class, a STEM space, I, I felt comfortable being there, even if I was the only girl, only black. And so that resonated for me when I thought about designing STEM spaces. I'm like we first have to get kids comfortable. And so let's think about putting programs in places where they are. So like libraries, parks, after school spaces where you can explore STEM with your peers to understand if it's for you before you get into that high, you know, that uh, that course in that class where where it's more high pressure. And so for me, it's really at let's understand how to make it relevant, STEM relevant in every day. And if we could do that and make visible those role models, folks using it in a in a way that's naturalistically engaging, then people put in the work and the time to develop the skills because it's interesting, not because you got to develop it for a grade and for a job. And so if you look at some of our work with uh, the launch of Umedia, to creation of the Digital Youth Network, um, and now our work uh, uh, in something called Ambassadors and Digital Divas, it all is grounded in real world community spaces that are, um, that are hopefully accessible in, in everyone's communities. Oh, thank you. Um, I appreciate you helping us understand how professors can connect and um, mm -hmm. conduct research and also build community outside the ivory tower. Like it gives us insight into your role as a professor. Mm -hmm. One last thing to say about it's like, I also think about things need to be sustainable, right? So um, my first mentor was, you know, Caroline, and she's doing her research, but she also has her schools, right? So her, you know, you see that it's not about a paper or a finding, it's about creating things that have longevity and sustainability. So that's also why working in real places that have, you know, that exist so that if your work is successful, it can continue. It can continue beyond the, beyond the life cycle of a grant. Right. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And thank you for working in real places. We appreciate that. <laughs> Um, and so I'll turn to Jean-Claude, who has a different type of role. So in your role as a president and CEO of Digital Promise Global, how are you bringing equity to the forefront as you work to design and scale innovation for those who've been historically and systematically uh, excluded? Thanks, Erica. I mean, so much of what Nicole just said resonates. And I, let me start there. And I'm going to come back a little bit, talk a bit about who I am, too, which I think uh, colors a lot of my perspectives and perhaps yeah. the way in which we actually approach the work. So this idea of context, cognition, and design, I really love that. Nicole actually wrote, wrote yeah. that down. Uh, as an organization, uh, Erica, we work at the intersection of three circles, we say. Research, again, we've got like about, again, about 40 learning scientists on staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a large practitioner base, so 60,000 teachers. We have a League of Innovative Students, a League mm -hmm. of Innovative Schools. Think about 150-ish uh, most progressive school superintendents uh, in the country. We have a global cities network. Again, we actually have a, a, a consortium going to Melbourne, uh, Australia, of U.S. superintendents, global cities to look at race, racism, social emotional learning in Melbourne, Australia. So, so we, we do that. And we also have uh, a big leaning on technology. So we mix the three together. We don't do research for research sake. We, don't, we do very little pure research. Everything we do is research to practice or practice to research. Mm -hmm. We build that two-way bridge. So we understand this idea of, you know, of community, context. One of our mm -hmm. proudest centers is the Center for Inclusive Innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. So you think about centering, not putting community at the table, but you center community and practitioners in the research, in the work that we actually do, with a heavy leaning on this idea of, of, of people who have been historically and systematically excluded. Mm -hmm. We use that expression because we think it aligns best with the UN SDGs and frankly leans on this idea of belonging and inclusion. Um, so we don't say marginalized, we use the expression excluded. Mm -hmm. Our North Star goals is all about that uh, as an organization. Really, how do we think about this idea of leapfrogging inequality? Uh, so how do we leverage what we know in the learning sciences, what we know in education research, what we know in technology? Uh, for example, you think about the pandemic, the question of digital transformation, could technology be a vehicle to actually help leapfrog 
inequality. We have an amazing structure called the Learner Variability Navigator. What it does is it takes a learning science, a science of development, and puts it into practice for teachers and for educators and for schools of education and for ed tech companies. So you think about this idea of not just personalization, but what are you personalizing and why? And, and how are you taking this idea of neurodiversity, taking the ideas of historical, historical exclusion and really design for that? Uh, and we think if you do that, then the rest of the population actually benefits. But let me step back a bit. You know, the perspective I always bring to my work um, here in the U.S. and particularly around the world is my own personal history. I was born in Haiti, uh, came to the U.S. when I was about 11 years of age. My parents had to escape the country because of a, death, of a brutal despot. So this idea of global north, global south is very present of mine for me um, because my teachers, my principal, my presidents always look like me. Uh, the joke I, I have, by the way, is I got called by a reporter when I was in Rochester when Obama was elected. Said, "Hey, you know, we have a, we have a black president." I'm like, "Well, it's an amazing <laughs> thing for the U.S. My president was always black when I was a kid." <laughs> um, you know, and I said, "Don't print that. Let me give you a better statement." Um, mm -hmm. But the fact is, when you when your heroes look like you, your, your opportunity ceiling is is not as limited. Uh, but mm -hmm. I've been living in the U.S. for over 40 years, so I've come to internalize all the microaggressions, all the trauma, frankly, African-Americans here have experienced. That when you live here, it's subliminal, right? So you see it sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's implicit, and you don't, you don't, you don't see it, but it, it comes into you. So all that colors the ways in which uh, I see what we have to create for opportunities for young people to live mm -hmm. for. So our work goes from early learning all the way to workforce development. We push very hard around redefining success. We say that math and literacy is a means to an end, not the end. In so many of our schools in poor, poor black and brown communities, that is the goal. But mm -hmm. I'm sure for our kids, uh, that is not the goal. We, we know, we expect it to happen. So redefining success is something we push. So we talk about economic mobility. We talk about agency. We talk about well-being, life, life, lifelong well-being. That for us is the goal that we, we strive to actually, actually accomplish. Mm. You know, yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate both of you for like bringing um, like to the forefront how you're engaging in this work so that it's meaningful, not just for the people who are doing the work, but it's meaningful for the youth and, and, and in their context and in their community based on who they saw growing up based on who they're seeing, you know, right now that um, there's all these different approaches to it, but it really is centering around trying to create like this experience that matters for students, that gives them the connections that they need um, in order to be successful by new means and new measures and new definitions so that they can um, live, right? And thrive in their lives. So um, I appreciate it. I, I mean, this is so much going on, mm -hmm. I'm excited. <laughs> I, like, I can listen to you guys talk all day. Um, um, for real. Um, and so in our previous conversations, both of you spoke about ecosystems, either that you're building them or you're thinking about how you might navigate or students might navigate them in order to have these like rich, um, personalized, meaningful learning experiences. And so I wanted to dig in a little bit there um, to give you guys an opportunity to discuss examples that allow um, you to illustrate why a focus on ecosystems can lead to more equitable access to learning. Um, and so, Nicole, um, I would love for you to share an example of, of how you've either built or leveraged ecosystems in order to achieve system level changes that make STEM learning okay. accessible. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do two examples at once and show why. Um, in some sense, I think I've always worked at the level of ecosystem, but oftentimes when I talk about it, we talked about the program level. So we did some work in Chicago, fortunate to partner with the public libraries to launch, um, to help them reimagine how to use libraries as, as, as learning spaces for young people and um, work to uh, recreate Harold Washington Library, which is the center library downtown and make it the go-to spot. Uh, for young black men actually to develop their digital media literacies and just to be a place to connect. Normally when we talked about that work, we would talk about our work in developing mentors and the program models that were there. Um, and so when others would take it, it was supported by the Obama uh, administration to take it at scale into the learning labs model. But when I reflected on that, oftentimes what wasn't discussed was that the fact that Umedia was located right downtown next to transportation. Kids had reduced bus fare so they can get there and stay without having to spend money. And so when others would take it, 
you would see it with the model, program model would be put in place, but not necessarily understanding all the ecosystem factors that were necessary to make it work. So going backwards, I then said, hey, I now need to be much more explicit in how we think about the ecosystem work and how we talk about not just the, the intervention, but everything you have to understand about it. And so now we lead something called Cities of Learning, where we work explicitly with city governments to document their out-of-school learning opportunities. But in doing that, we're also keep creating a blueprint of all the places and spaces where learning takes place, because every program has a location, an address, and has an organization that's doing that. And so historically, if you collect that data using all our current systems, you create a map, a blueprint that shows equity and inequity. And so you then take those maps and have conversations with communities to say, well, where should we take a program like Umedia? Where should it be? Where do we have barriers so we can begin to think about how to how to educate others? So we now that um, started in Chicago, it's in Dallas, it's in um, Evanston, it's now in Tulsa. And these are now, you know, maps, if you will, if you think about that light up, you know, out of school opportunity and allow cities, agencies and funders to to think about better allocation um, of resources. So I'm most excited about that because I think it, it provides both an opportunity for um, shared understanding, but also an opportunity for families to go in and find the programs that work for them without, you know, currently, if you think about your kids and you say, I want to, I want to find something for them to do. Is there one location, one, lo one, one, one URL where you can go to in your community and say, here's everything that's going on? Most likely not. So it's only very resource parents who have connections, right? who already do the opportunity hoarding, who can find those opportunities. So our goal is to make visible and accessible to everyone a one-stop shop of all the opportunities that both families can use. But then you can hold civic leaders responsible for ensuring that they're more effectively allocating the resources so that if you say something like every kid to learn to code, you actually have put in place the infrastructure for every kid to learn to code. Oh, thank you so much. That's really, really great. I like... Um, the idea of both like mapping so that people know where these resources, but also bringing it back to the community to work mm -hmm. along with them to figure out mm -hmm. where those inequities exist um, so that the community can be a part of um, either mm -hmm. changing it or putting pressure. <laughs> on, um, on and it. the last thing, because I want to combine this to uh, uh, John Cobb, you were saying about understanding the systemic, historical and systemic um Barriers, because oftentimes without going back and showing those maps and connecting them to redlining and greenlining, a community is sitting there thinking, not realizing that, you know, the, you know, systematically the resources aren't there. And so unless we own that systematic uh, um, lack of investment in some communities and overinvestment in other communities, we're never able to truly um, put in place the resources uh, that are necessary to get us to where it is we're trying to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then um, Jean-Claude, I'd love for you to share an example in your work that offers us insight into how partners or stakeholders within um, ecosystem are working together toward equitable or innovative learning. Absolutely. And let me just start by, by uh, building a little bit on, on what Nicole was just talking about. Uh, the Racial Equity Institute, REI, has an amazing white paper called the um, sort of the groundwater metaphor, right? Um, and it talks about what the metaphor is very simple. If you find a dead, dead fish, you treat the fish, or a sick fish, you treat the fish. If you find every fish in the lake uh, to be to be <laughs> ill, to be sick, you treat the water. Mm -hmm. But if every lake in nearby is sick, you know it's not the lake, it's not the fish, it's the groundwater. So get in, mm -hmm. get in there. When you look at communities or ecosystem, and you find kids who are having educational disparities, you tend to find the exact same young people, same people in healthcare disparities, criminal justice issues. I mean. All these near sectors tend to parallel each other in a way that is really powerful. It's a powerful uh, white paper. So when you think about this idea of ecosystem work, you can't just address one thing, one layer. You have to see all the mutually reinforcing layers and how they contribute or they come together to create the kinds of systems and issues that we're seeing. So I'll give you a, a, a bunch of examples. When I was at the Gates Foundation, I led a team that focused on this idea of P16 community investment. So we look to see the, the trajectory and the journey of a child from early learning all the way through post-secondary. And by the way, the average state, 25% of people get a post-secondary degree who are proficient in reading and math in third grade. If you look, if you wrap around an equity lens on all of this, it's 8 to 12%. 
it, it is it is terrifying to see the 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 um uh, I, I use hemorrhaging, but I was told not to use that word anymore. It's <laughs> the attrition of kids along the system, but it really is hemorrhaging, watching kids like leave and drop off the system. Um, mm -hmm. So w one example I found, and we had a, a few that really for me was exemplary, and it's the commit work, the commit partnership in Dallas, Texas. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, I think Texas itself as a state has a theory of change. Look, I don't love the politics in Texas. I'm, I'm going to be honest about that as well, too. But when you look at the education work, what people are trying to do, the state itself has a theory of change, and people mm -hmm. tend to coalesce around that. But in, in Dallas in particular, you see an effort around this idea of collective effort uh, or mm -hmm. collective impact in some cases, where, where you see this, this third-party aggregator pulling together a different strand of different community uh, uh, from grasslands to grassroots to come together and solve a particular problem. They, what, what they're focusing on is education outcome. In fact, mm -hmm. economic mobility is the, is the goal, but they mm -hmm. look at everything from reading proficiency to teacher development to fi finances. Then they go to the state and fight for the policies they need to actually make things happen in Dallas, but it's so mm -hmm. the whole state benefits. Um, so HB3, which was a, a windfall of dollars into education, came from this one coalition that built a statewide coalition to address a particular issue. So there, there, there are more examples like uh, Rio Grande Valley Focus, uh, Buffalo, CS Buffalo, uh, Graduate Tacoma and Tacoma, Washington. But what I see, you have these kinds of coalitions. Yes, we're focused on education, but all the near sectors uh, up at the table, housing included, by the way, you tend to see outcomes beginning to actually happen in a way that is sustainable over time. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you bringing up that example, like of a third party aggregator to really kind of underscore the importance of the right partners, but then also figuring out how to um, activate and facilitate them so that these changes can happen in ways that matter. Um, so ooh, thank you. We have a question from Joel that I'd like to pose to you all. Um, where do you think other non-STEM disciplines and their practitioners have an opportunity to impact this work, particularly mm -hmm. those in the business sector? Um, mm -hmm. um, so one, I think that um, um, from the business sector, one of the things we're trying to do is be be able to be smarter mm -hmm. in how we fund. Um, so mm -hmm. as a faculty member, I often can get grants, um, but to be transparent, oftentimes where I place my work is not necessarily a subject of collective conversation of where it makes the most sense to, to be impactful in the community. And part of that is because we don't have a shared understanding of where the needs are in the community. So one of the things I think, and we're trying to do some of this here in Chicago, is uh, bringing funders together to say, we want to fund a collective body of work, but instead of you know them finding each individual you know selecting, how do we understand, use our maps and understanding where needs are? and to work together to uh, to fund, to be more equitable in how we allocate, you know, the money. It shouldn't always go to, you know, faculty members. And how do we figure out how to support, um, how do we figure out how to support CBOs? But again, that, that requires us to work in networks in ways in which it's easier to find where the funding is, but also how we can support smaller organizations who are really on the ground in being able to write those proposals and being able to do the documentation of the work that happens to show so the impact. So I think that's one place where foundations can, uh, where business sectors oftentimes are funding. Uh, some of the, particularly in the STEM work in their local communities can be impactful. But also I think we, you know, STEM is this word, but I actually often use STEAM um, because I'm particularly with young, uh, with younger uh, populations. It's like, it's everything. We make it seem like it's this one specific thing, but it's actually what in your life does not include uh, STEM. So part, I think we also need to demystify and not make it seem that only people with STEM backgrounds have a voice in the design and creation of, of learning spaces that um, are, are meant to motivate and support everyone in engaging. One of, there's a, there's a researcher, uh, there's an article um, from Hide and Reniger that talks about uh, four phases of interest development. And what it says is that you can't, if I want you to be an uh, engineer, you, you're not going to be an engineer if you don't know what it is, unless you first are in an environment that's engaging, safe, and comfortable, right? That you can, you can play around with engineering topics or opportunities in a place where you feel you want to be. Because if you're in a place that you don't want to be, then you're never going to engage it in that particular space. And so I think that requires people who know kids, who know 
who know how to engage them to be in the conversation for the beginning and not, I think, which we've done a bad job of is over empowering STEM experts to create the intro STEM opportunities, which then only, you know, folks like me, it worked for me, but it didn't work for the other, you know, 90% of black girls in my, in, in growing up with. And so I think we need to rebalance, uh, rebalance those relationships and, and make sure that we're particularly in the beginning uh, opportunities, making sure we're being smarter about where we place opportunities. And also we're thinking more holistically about the engagement, uh, making things safe and, and inviting and joyful. So I use the word joyful still to create things is joyful. And the last thing is that we're also inviting parents in. I use the analogy of uh, travel sports. I, I grew up playing basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player. I My whole life was I wanted to you know play basketball. The, it, WNBA didn't exist. So when it came time to choose college, I chose Stanford because I couldn't go to the NBA. If it existed, I probably would have gone. I probably um, would have gone someplace else. But if you think about sports, there's an expectation of parents. There's an expectation of the role they play. They're sitting in the stands. But if you think about STEM, parents don't, they drop their kids off. And then they come pick them up. And the assumption is I'm giving my kid to this expert who's going to do this. And so we then don't have a way to connect in. So I think that's the other um, way in is how to make sure we're, we're more strategic about parents learning how to play and be and create joyful STEM experiences in their home to connect what takes place in outer school and at home. I'm sorry, that was a long answer, yeah. but it's that's okay. a so that's a great question. Yeah. Nicole, can I can I just add a, a yes. couple of layers to 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 uh, Nicole's response to Joel's question? Let me just add two two things. One is when we think about this idea of of the profile of a graduate, which we see now more and more school districts across the country are doing that. Meaning that what do we want a high school graduate to look like? Mm -hmm. Redefining the credential as a pivot point to mm -hmm. demonstrate what you've learned in the first 12, 13 years of school and what you're prepared to do beyond. So what we see often is missing is the sort of cascading work that needs to happen from pre-K all the way to that 12th grade. So one thing we do here at Digital Promise, again, study of non-STEM disciplines and STEM disciplines, is we actually work with teachers in, in demonstration projects, for example. We're talking to Baltimore City as a potential next place to do this, where we sit with groups of teachers in ELA, in math, in science, in social studies, and we actually take the existing curriculum and look at the kinds of skills and competencies you want the young person to have, in addition mm -hmm. to, the, to the math and reading skills, and you really rejigger the units of study, the lessons. So the question is not just having a flowery set of standards and, and a profile, but what does that look like Monday ninth, uh, in ninth grade uh, uh, social studies history class? in ELA mm -hmm. class, right? So we get to that level of granularity to demonstrate what's possible to bring all the disciplines together to, to, get, to build a whole human being. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one way of doing that. The other, um, and I want to get to the business sector in this mm -hmm. case, um, I was on the board of uh, Hood Mifflin Harcourt. Uh, we just sold the company a few months ago. What I love is I was on the committee, the SEG committee, the Social Environmental Governance Committee. And you think about what that means. So it's the new CSR, right? That you, so many of us talk about in business, uh, where the social is really around equity, diversity, uh, what are you doing for your community? The environmental, as you can imagine, all around sort of like a carbon footprint, et cetera. Yeah. But what, what that has become, including for investors on Wall Street, is a way to see if companies really are responding to their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's an amazing vehicle to get the business sector really involved, not just in education or to become um, sort of good citizens and do for, but to really become part of a community yeah. and engage holistically. That is a powerful vehicle. I'm really hoping that the dollars and walls will keep pushing in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much. Um, um, as we start to come to a close, I just want to just share my appreciation for how this conversation has really um, centered like the whole child and and how mm -hmm. they are placed in their community mm -hmm. and in the world. And so um, in this last like response and talking about um, it's not just about doing STEM activities, but how do you create this space? Um, where students are safe and engaged and filled with joy as they're engaged in their learning, as well as thinking about um, both in some companies like our civic partners and our business partners and how do they come in to mm -hmm. really interact in impactful ways um, for our students so that when they contribute, when they share resources, when they share their expertise, that it's um, really going to move the needle on creating these more equitable learning spaces. So I, I appreciate all that you shared. You have dropped so many nuggets. Um, you have dropped more than nuggets, like just 
loads of information has come down on us and your knowledge and obviously your inspiration for us to make this world a, um, a more just place. And so I just want to give you the opportunity to just share one more piece of inspiration um, with us. Um, um, so I just want to ask, like, um, and we can go John Claude, and then we can go Nicole um, mm -hmm. in 60 seconds or less. Um, what inspires you to continue your work at the intersection of equity, technology, and learning? I mean, I'll let me just, I mean, um, I'm going to get to Imani's question too at the same time. I'll try to both in 60 seconds. Um, one is that I, it's my parents, frankly. You know, my parents were social activists. Uh, there were people who saw people would disappear and die. And they, they left this imprint on us to always do and to support and to agitate and to advocate, right? So that they're, the voice is always in my head. Very quickly to Imani's point, uh, I have found that when you have things like first robotics competition, when you have uh, maker spaces, mm -hmm. parents just be, just get as jazzed <laughs> about STEM <laughs> as they are about sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would, yeah I, would, I would say that we haven't created the spaces to invite parents and my brother, we grew up in the same household and he spends the time and energy on sports. He also wants my nephews to be as great in engineering. But what he says is, I don't know how to get on the floor with them in engineering. I know how to practice basketball with them, but help me know how to be vulnerable with them in STEM, right? And if you can do that, then I'm more is willing to do it. And, and as an example, we put some activities in their in their um, garage and now my nephew's basketball uh Teammates are over there geeking out in STEM. So I think is we just have to use the metaphors of other spaces and to say, well, what would that look like in this space? And I think U.S. First Robotics is a great example of where they did that. And they sort of made it a competition and things and people show up and root and are there. And I would say for me, why I continue to do this work is because the journey is not over. I was fortunate to grow up in an ecosystem where it, I just stumbled constantly into opportunities with mentors that allowed me to engage in developing my computational skills from eighth grade through, right? And, and you know, and it's just not there yet for um, the next generation or the, you know, coming after. And so until I feel confident that um, that's happening for my great nephews and nieces, then, you know, the work continues and I'll continue to do it. Oh, well, thank you both, Nicole Pinkert and Jean-Claude Prezard. I appreciate all that you have shared with us, your journey, your experiences, and your insights. Um, so I can't wait to have you guys back <laughs> on another show. It's been wonderful. Um, I will be back on Friday, October 28th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern with Dr. Brandis Marshall, who's the mm -hmm. author of Data Conscious algorithmic siege on our humanity and our discussion will be a remix of data science and social justice so watch mm -hmm. your feed and check your inbox so that you have the details to tune into the next show and until then visit the remix eq live webpage for past episodes and more information about our inspiring guests um, mm -hmm. and upcoming shows um learn why rally is the battle cry for this season of remix eq live and how we recognize appreciate learn, love, and take care of you as you work to make this world a more just place. And while you're there, please poke around the website and learn a bit more about my business, Blue Knowledge, and how we advance equity in schools and communities. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. And of course, I invite you to connect with me too. Thank you, Remix EQ Live community, for your engagement, your questions, um, your encouragement that keeps us inspired to make this world a more just place. I'm your host, Dr. Erica Tate, and this is Remix EQ Live, and I'll see you guys next time. Mm-hmm. <laughs>